the steering committee that does a little bit of behind the scenes work to make Wednesday morning roundtable work. I would like to welcome everyone here this morning. Um, new year for our program, new venue for our program, and some new members in the room for the program. And um, I thought maybe it'd just be fun if you haven't already met someone that's here for the first time, just for the folks that are here as new members of Wednesday Morning Roundtable to raise your hands and let us know who you are. Are there any? Tell me. Of course there are. Raise them up. All right, there we go. They're all in the front of the room. Welcome to uh, our new members and welcome to all the returning members. Some of the same people sit in the same spots no matter where the venue is in the back. They, don't see they, uh, they know how to get those seats. So um, what I wanted to do this morning, especially for the benefit of the new members that are here, is just give you a quick little kind of synopsis of what we try to do in about 60 minutes, plus or minus. And that is to um, bring one good conversation of civic interest to the table for discussion with a speaker or two or three, or in this case this morning, four, that have something to offer around a topic that we think is of interest to our community and to those in the room. And uh, we'll do that with a, usually start off with about 30 minutes of kind of talk from up here. Um, that's not to say you can't have a question or jot it down. Um, and we try to reserve the balance of the time for some Q&A. So that's really where I think we get into some of the stuff that's on our minds. and usually some of the things that the speakers maybe didn't expect to have on their minds. So um, let's proceed with that idea. When we've got four speakers on the panel this morning, we're going to be very judicious with our timekeeping, and that'll be my job. Um, I wanted to at least start off with um, a little bit of the topic that we kind of pick from time to time, um, an important topic for any community, our community in particular, being in a little bit more of a rural um, area without metropolitan services, that you find, or services you find in a metropolitan area around healthcare, we talk about healthcare. And today we're um, fortunate to have four people with us representing our local hospital, Auburn Community Hospital. And I just wanted to give a quick rundown of who we are going to hear from this morning and uh, see if we can proceed with the, with the program and then uh, get right into it. So on my immediate left is Tony Franciscelli. Tony is the vice chair of the board of trustees at Auburn Community Hospital. Tony is uh, somewhat pinch hitting this morning. Joe Bartolotta, who was a share, was hoping to be here, but um, we might get better off with Tony anyways, if you want to tell. Hey, this is fair game. He's not here. <laughs> um, Tony, in his day job, is a vice president at Tompkins Trust Company and wears a lot of other hats in the community. If you uh, know his involvement with a lot of organizations from the YMCA to um, the Emerson Foundation, and many others, um, that is what makes Tony tick. Next to Tony is Scott Berlucci. Scott is the president and CEO of Auburn Community Hospital, a job he's held since April 2007. Scott came to Auburn from Pennsylvania, where he ran two different health organizations down there. He got his uh, graduate work done at George Washington University. Scott is uh, someone that is known to many of us in this room and the community. We're glad to have Scott here. Next to Scott is Jason Lesh. Jason, just over a year ago, started out as an employee of Auburn Community Hospital um, as an assistant, um, uh, uh, assistant chief financial CFO, and it was soon thereafter he was named and appointed the CFO um, in November last year. So Jason comes to the hospital with a lot of experience in auditing, um, consulting work, turnaround work, and um, Jason, I think, has been a very important member of the team at ACH. He is also then an elected member of the Auburn School Board, so it's another civic hat that he wears. Next to Jason, and last on our program this morning is Dr. John Riccio. Uh, Dr. Riccio is the um, with the Department of Pathology at the hospital. Um, he has been uh, since 2003 um, the director of the medical lab and chief of pathology, and since 2007 is also president of the Auburn Memorial Medical Services PC Group that the hospital has, and um, since 2009, he has also served on the board. So he and Tony are members of the board of trustees um, together in their duties there. So this morning's program was very simply identified on the program for us today as Auburn Community Hospital today and in the future. And I think it's important to note that there's probably a lot of topics that can be covered there. 
I'm going to turn it over to Tony, who's going to start the program. We're going to try with them sitting down. If those in the back can't see, can't hear, raise your hand. We've got a microphone that they can use. And um, like I said, I'm going to try to keep the time thing going. So right. please pay attention. I'll give you a little heads up. When we we did hand out some pamphlets. Uh, I, I only didn't know there were this many people. So uh, try to share um, what, what, what's, what's in here. Ready to roll? Yep. Tony. All right. Thank you, Dan. Um, welcome, everyone. Welcome, new members. Great to see some new faces at the round table. And uh, it's uh, a nice venue today. Uh, a little more room to come around in and socialize uh, before and after the meeting. So um, it's great to have it here at the Hill. Um, like Dan said, I'm pitch hitting, so I'm, I'm going to read some of uh, Joe's opening commentary here, but uh, and, and wing it a little bit. So, uh, back of the room, okay, hearing us? Okay, great. Uh, Auburn Community Hospital is a critical component to this community, as we all know. Um, it, it services a hundred thousand population in Auburn and Puget County and surrounding counties. Um, that's a significant number of people, and our job. Um, as we'll hear throughout this pro program today, is how do we maintain a critical care hospital in Cuba County? And that's um, what the board has been working on uh, for the last <coughs> three years. It's part of our strategic plan that we're working on. And there's four pieces to our strategic plan. Um, one is a, having a rural integrated delivery system. And I'm not going to go into any depth on any of these because, first off, I know about that much of each of these, and uh, I'm sure they're going to be touched on uh, throughout here with the uh, hospital employees. So, um, our next goal was to stabilize the hospital. I, I think everybody reads that you know the hospital's in trouble. Um, we have some financial issues, but a lot of that has been straightened out. We brought on a new CFO, and Jason Lesh. Um, a year ago, um, a lot of changes in the accounting finance area, uh, a lot of improvements under the leadership of Scott and uh, his executive team there, uh, along with the board uh, oversight. Uh, and I think you've read in the paper another item that we're working on is seeking partnership and affiliations. Uh, I'm not going to get into what, what that is today, but rest assured we've spent a lot of time looking at this and, and still in the process of um, talking to partner and uh, um, affiliation and how that may work uh, for Auburn Community Hospital. And then the last item we were very um, concerned about in our strategic plan is the primary care system in Auburn and Cuba County. And uh, I think Dr. Riccio is going to talk about, you know, um, in our packet here there is um, 20, how many people in our private practice? 35 practitioners and 20 physicians. See, there you go. He has the answers. I know what we're talking about. Um, again, um, we are, the hospital is a high quality, low cost provider of services. Um, and we are ranked uh, in the top percentile of hospitals in this, uh, in this criteria. So I think everything's going full steam ahead with our partnership affiliation, um, our profitability at the hospital is going well. Uh, we're, at, uh, uh, we're at a critical stage here where all hospitals have to look at affiliations and partnerships and we're not immune from that. So, uh, And in that process there's three things that the board is very interested in in any kind of affiliation or partnership. Uh, first is maintain an acute care hospital in Cuba County, access to capital, which is um, very important to us, uh, you know, with, with um, being able to borrow and, and um, access funds to continue to uh, expand the hospital, update. Um, we have an aging facility that needs some update, as everybody knows, it's, uh, that's a common issue to any organization. And then the last is local control and governance of the hospital. So those are the three primary issues that are on the table for the board and uh, executive team at the hospital. And with that, I'll stop and 
introduce um, Scott Berlucci, who is our CEO of the hospital and is, uh, as the president said, he's been here since 2007. And, uh, I'll turn it over to him. So when, when I was contacted to, to present to you guys, um, I, I, I thought, you know, what a hospital really is, is it's the working, it's the interrelationship between the board, the medical staff, and administration. That's why four of us are up here. Um, I thought, rather than, you know, me standing up here, um, like uh, so many times I'm asked to do, uh, and try to represent each point of view, I thought it really would be best um, that the board be present, really, to answer to the community. Um, as an executive, you know, my world is a, my world is is complex, but it's simplistic. I focus on quality of care, um, uh, profitability, and implementing the strategic plan. Um, profitability is a tough thing in our business, and that's why I have the CFO to my left. So. Um, all the accountants, uh, Alice, I see you hiding back there. Um, all the uh, all the accountants. I mean, he, he can speak that language. It's t it's it's a tough business um, um, with Obamacare, trying to make a margin. Um, you are a small rural hospital. We don't have a lot of reserves, um, and I think you're going to see uh, a lot of activity in upstate New York as small rural hospitals seek varying types of partnerships and affiliations. And I'll touch on that a, a little bit. Um, and it's happening both ways. It's not only happening with little hospitals trying to pair up with big hospitals, it's big hospitals pairing up with even bigger hospitals, and it's bigger hospitals teaming up with these national corporations. Um, and what's it all about? It's all about trying to deliver high quality, low-cost health care. Why? Well, because the cost of health care continues to increase. Um, Excellus Blue Cross and Aetna and all the insurance plans, they can't continue to come to all of you as em employers with premium increases of 10 and 15 and 25 percent, right? Um, so they're trying to work more closely with hospitals and doctors to try to keep the premium dollar down trying to keep the level of service where it is, if not more. And then that really promotes all of us to sort of consolidate and partner and affiliate. So Tony really touched on you know, what we've really been doing at the board level. Uh, Jason will touch on the economics of the hospital, but I've also asked him to touch on the economic engine that the hospital is in this community. So often, um, what gets lost in translation is every meeting I go to, whether it's with you know Andrew Fish in the chamber or any economic development council, um, what we have to realize is the gem in your community is, is, is a hundred million dollar enterprise. We started, Tony and I, in 07, it was maybe a 60 million dollar enterprise. We've grown it to 105 million, that's our annual budget. Um, Haney's, uh, the Hospital Association of New York, did an economic study that said that annually the hospital pumps about $175 million into the local economy. Maybe Jason can explain how all that happens, but um, it's not just all the people that we employ, but it's all the business that we generate. For every physician that we recruit, it's said that we create 35 more jobs either at the hospital or out in the community. So um, as we talk about health care, remember, you know, the other side of the business is really a very, very large economic driver, in this case for Auburn and Cube County. And uh, then I've asked Dr. Riccio, who's on the board, he's our chief medical officer, really to speak about that third leg, which is the medical staff. Um, and and that's, a that's, a, that's a job unto itself. And we have 175 doctors on staff, uh, probably 50 more mid-levels. Um, and you, we're not gonna be, you're gonna be amazed at how, how, how many people come over to the hospital, whether John touches on the ER, up to 25,000 visits a year, the urgent care centers, 20,000 visits a year. 
like I always tease Dan, I'm like, well, that's 45,000 people. There's not that many people in Auburn. Is it like the same guy coming through like 45,000 times? It's kind of interesting how many people flow through. So my comments are this. Um, uh, the hospital is stable um, today from a profitability standpoint, uh, but we're very, very challenged, uh, as all, all hospitals are. Um, we're committed to keeping an acute care hospital in Auburn. We've had proposals put, for, 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 put before us to do something different, um, and, and we just think our community absolutely po uh, positively needs a full-service acute care hospital in Auburn uh, because in the middle of February, trying to get anywhere else around here sometimes is, is difficult. Um, I've provided a list of all of the doctors that we continue to recruit. Um, this sheet was blank in 08, and now it's like 30. So all of these specialties, uh, we've, we've hired all these doctors. You know, in the old days when I was growing up, all the doctors were independent. Now they're all employees of the hospital or of one of our corporations. So, you know, John will touch upon that a little bit. Um, the future. The, the future is our, the way we get paid is changing. It was fee-for-service. So if I do 10 MRIs, I get paid for 10 MRIs. If I do 10 appendectomies, we get paid for 10 appendectomies. But it's changing. It's changing over to managed care. And, and that's going to happen over the next five years. So now we'll be getting paid, hypothetically, to take care of everybody in this room for a set sum of X. As opposed to today, when each one of you come into the hospital and have a test or have a procedure, we would get paid for that. So our whole dynamic is changing as opposed to how we get reimbursed. Um, we are well positioned for this future. We are a high quality, low cost provider, and we know that by all of our statistics. Our market covers nearly 75% not only of Auburn, but really of Cayuga County. We have an office up in Wayne that a lot of folks don't know about. A lot of things don't bear our name. Um, you know, there'll be affiliations and people who come under our auspices, but a lot of times we'll just keep the local names local because that's what everybody sort of relates to. Um, strategically, um, we're talking about partnerships and affiliation. In 2011, um, we attempted to merge and affiliate with Rochester General Hospital. And um, I think, you know, we came before this group and we talked about that so early on and then 90 days later, Rochester General decided it wasn't really a very good fit. Then I spent the next year trying to explain to this public what went wrong. What did they find? What's wrong with Auburn? So, you know, if you would all just bear with me, um, we're back at that same process again, only this time with St. Joe's and the University of Rochester, but I'm not going to say anything. I'm not jinxing myself again, because <laughs> if they walk away, I don't want to try to explain to everybody. There's nothing wrong with Auburn, okay? So, but we're very, very excited. The same, the same strategy that the board and the medical staff had in 2010 and 2011, recognizing Auburn, we're stronger if there's a broader partnership. We never gave up on that dream. And I'm certainly glad that we didn't, because if this um, potential partnership affiliation comes to fruition, where we have a Syracuse partner and a great entity in St. Joe's uh, that our community knows very well, and to the West, you know, we have a partnership with arguably one of the top 25 academic medical centers in the country. Um, gives me goosebumps ju just having the opportunity to be at that table trying to negotiate the best thing for, for Auburn. Um, and, and so keep our fingers crossed because that would really set us up uh, for years to come. I'm going to stop at that point, uh, ask Dr. Riccio or Dr. Riccio to, or Jason. Uh, yeah, the finance guy can skip over. Yeah, the will tell you some words. Yeah, yeah, because well, he has to pay for everything at the end. I actually nicknamed him, you know, it's CFO, 
Well, I've nicknamed him CF No. <laughs> so if anybody goes to him asking for money, he's supposed to say, say no. But I thought John could touch on the new doctors, the rural integrated delivery system, why we think we're well positioned for this new future of, of health care. Um, and, then, and then we'll go back to Jason to help us figure out how we're going to pay for all this. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Uh, at some point in, in my career and in Scott's career, I'm surprised we didn't cross paths because we spent a lot of time in Pennsylvania. Uh, I went to medical school in New Jersey, did my residency at Geisinger um, Health System out in Danville, Pennsylvania, fellowship in Philadelphia, and everything that we're talking about now occurred at least 10 years ago in Pennsylvania. So a, a lot of the concepts that we brought up here, we brought here from Pennsylvania, this whole notion of fee-for-service, switching over to capitated care, uh, it, it's, it's not new. It's, it's all over the rest of the country in one form or another. Um, and when I came up here, I kind of thought I died and went to heaven. And we lived under a bubble still. We still had fee-for-service, and today we still have fee-for-service. I've been in Auburn since 2000, so I've been practicing here for 15 years. Before that, uh, from the early 90s, I was at St. Joe's in Syracuse, and before that, I was an attending in the Lehigh Valley uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, so I, I've seen a few things, not quite as much as Scott has. He's, he's the turnaround expert. Uh, but what we've tried to do here is we've tried to put our experience and uh, our limited knowledge into a, a strategic plan, which you have in your folder. And in the past, the hospital would have been in the center. In the future, the patient is in the center. And everything else orbits around the patient. In the lower right side, you see in the purple, the acute care setting, that's the hospital and everything that occurs at the hospital. Above that, upper right side, the orange, ambulatory care, well, that's pretty much your doctor's office and what happens at your doctor's office. So in 2007, we embarked on this multi-specialty practice that we recognized, you know, in order to get good specialists here at Auburn to support, at that time what we had was a very extensive primary care base, we needed to, to go out there and really take the bull by the horns and hire these people ourselves. And that's what we did. There's 35 practitioners on this page, 20 of whom are physicians. Um, an example of the kind of physicians that we are recruiting, also on the left-hand side of your handout, Rhonda Thomas, a seasoned orthopedic surgeon. Eric Murray, a fellowship-trained podiatrist from Philadelphia. Alan Sherburn, just finished his uh, residency in general surgery at Massachusetts General in Boston. And Ryan Sidebottom, whose office is about to open this Monday, a um, very well-trained, fellowship-trained urologist from Philadelphia. These are the kind of physicians that are joining our multi-specialty practice group, the kind of physicians that come up here and realize that Central New York is indeed a very well-kept secret. I moved up here from New Jersey and Pennsylvania, and I raised my kids here. The schools are phenomenal. Okay, it snows. We all know that. But it snows elsewhere, too. We have no tornadoes, we have no hurricanes, we have no floods. We have a little bit of snow. We can deal with that. So that's that's why we recruit all these doctors in the summer. So it's been a, it's been a strategy that has worked well. Now, what about the other side of the equation here? How do we how do we deal with patients after the acute care setting? Well, we have a five-star nursing home and rehab center attached to our hospital, an 80-bed, five-star nursing home and rehab center called Finger Lake Center for Living. You probably all know about it. It's one of the only five-star designated uh, long-term care facilities in upstate New York. So we're very proud of that. We've worked very, very hard to achieve that. And then in the community health setting, you probably have heard in one form or another this thing called DISRIP, uh, Medicaid Reform. Well, we have uh, begun that about a year ago, and we went out and became a lead, uh, PPS is what they call it, a 
to lead um, to try to get all of the community agencies in Cayuga County and the surrounding area on board so that we can go as a united front to try to go to the, to the state government and say we have everything here that's necessary to take care of patients from the acute care hospital setting to afterwards. And also in your packet is a two-page handout of about 35 organizations from Cayuga County and surrounding regions that have joined us in that initiative. We couldn't go out and recreate this, nor would we want to. You heard Scott say that we're a $100 million entity for a 100-bed hospital. The math is pretty simple. It costs a million dollars a year for each bed that we own to keep it open and keep it running. And Jason will tell you that that's pretty much industry standard. So we have a very expensive business to run, and it's very, very hard to generate any sort of a profit margin at all. If we get a 1% margin, we're happy. If we get a 2% margin, we're ecstatic. For most of you, you'd probably be out of business if you had a 1% profit margin. But our real goal is to make sure that we keep good quality physicians, good quality of care, Keep that care local and it's here when you need us. Hopefully, I won't see any of you for years at the hospital. But sooner or later, we will all need those services. And if they're not here, it's going to be a significant hardship and a significant burden for any of us. We have an, an excellent medical staff right now. It's a mixture of employed physicians, physicians employed by this multi specialty practice group. Uh, private physicians who are the traditional model in private practice and as you can see here we've just started to get into primary care because through attrition retirement a lot of the primary care docs that were in practice mostly in private practice when I first got here are now retired or gone or have left the area uh, and we recognize that and the remaining practices were working feverishly <coughs> to try to keep up with the demand they recruited a few docs, but we said, you know, we really need to get into this and, and help out. We had consultants come in who told us that we needed as many as 30 to 50 new primary care doctors. Well, we didn't quite believe that, but we certainly believe that there was a need for five or ten more. And that's what we're embarking on right now, to try to bolster primary care. Because in the future, it's going to be the primary care doctor's main job to keep you well and keep you out of the hospital. That's how we're going to get paid. And what a lofty goal that is if you think about it. It means that you're going to be an active participant in your own health. You're going to become a consumer. You're going to become a smart shopper. And we welcome all of that. Uh, why, Scott says, that we are a low cost and, and high quality organization? Why do we know that? Well, we look at our own numbers, but outside agencies look at our numbers as well. For example, CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the federal government, they say that we are a high-cost, or a low-cost, high-quality organization. Our, our quality scores have just come out for the second year in a row. We're among the highest rated quality scores in the area. Uh, also, Jason can tell you about our, our cost structure even though the numbers I threw at you are pretty staggering, we're still considered a low-cost hospital for, for each and everything that we do. Thank you, John. You know, but at the end of the day, I mean, we're a not-for-profit 501c3, so when we do make a buck, um, it all gets reinvested back into the hospital. And, and for, so, for example, we're upgrading our MRI in the spring. I think the tag was about 2.5 million. Um, we constantly upgrade all of our technology. So as a not-for-profit 501c3, it's, it's, the, it's, we are um, mission-focused, but simultaneously we must be margin-focused. Um, and turning services into cash collections in our business is extremely complex, and nobody knows that book of business better, in my opinion, than Jason Lesh. Um, so I'd like to introduce Jason, our Chief Financial Officer. Uh, he can tell us about the school board first, because I'm always fascinated about that school board. <laughs> uh, but with that, let me turn it over to, thank you, John, and turn it over to, to Jason. Well, when I was on the school board, I, <laughs> I learned a tremendous amount, and there's Lisa in the back, about how it worked. 
right? Being from the community, I never understood how the school really worked, how did it function, what great things were going on in the school district. And the hospital has been the same way. Uh, they're tremendous. We're doing so many great things that we need to get out to the community that I've learned about, my, my family doesn't even know about. But, you know, having a, a designated stroke center, Silver, Silver Award, yeah. in our community, uh, where you can get that access immediately, I mean, your brain's going to die if you have to go to Syracuse, which is tremendous. The bariatric program, watching the people walk down the hall to get, I mean, you're, we're saving their lives. Um, so we're trying to continually do better every day. I see it. Um, and we're moving fast because the healthcare system is moving so fast. And we're nimble, we're able to do it. Now, how did we get, I'm, I, we're positioned extremely well for this. And now, how do we get there? I mean, you read in the paper, the hospital's going to go out of business. It's hard to believe that we're saying we're doing well. Well, the state stepped in and the Emerson Foundation stepped in about a year ago to help us. And we took those funds, and the state gave us 4.6, and we had a $10 million improvement in our current assets and our current liabilities. And we're going to make money this year. We've hired 17 new people this year. Our volumes are going up. People are coming to the hospital. Our ER visits are up 10%. Our admissions are up 10%. Our visits in our physician office building. We own AMMS. We're the ones recruiting all the specialists to the area. They're up 10%. So people are coming um, to the hospital. For every dollar we generate in revenue, 105 million, we contribute basically in payroll 50% of that. So 50 some million are coming back into this community. The majority of the people live within 10 miles. So that's an enormous amount of money that's coming into this community. And when we hire people, these are good paying jobs. Healthcare is still good paying jobs um, compared to what's happened in manufacturing, et cetera, other industries. So, you know, we're rolling. MRI, we're going to have a 3T MRI, the only one in the county. Um, they'll compete regionally with that. 3D mammography is coming in to us within the next um, couple months. And we're, we're extremely well positioned because we are low cost, high quality. And in the future, you know, St. Joe's and Rochester, they don't want a pneumonia case. You know, that pneumonia case might sit in their bed for 10 days. Right, where they could turn that bed over twice with a heart case and generate a lot more money. So we're going to be working together on how do we keep those cases here where we can make money at them and keep them out of the higher cost hospitals. So, you know, it's been a tremendous turn. We're continuing to work on it. There's a lot of opportunity here. You know, we are going to be here. Um, and as long as the community continues to support us, we're there. To, to do better every single day. And if there's any concerns, anyone has any questions, just come to us and ask us, and they will get resolved. Uh, how's that, Dan? Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that's, an, that's an awful lot of information in a short amount of time. We just gave you the 20 year strategic I, I did not expect hope, you guys to get through. Hope you, <laughs> hope you appreciated all of it. So, um, we'll transition to uh, the opportunity for folks in the room to ask a question or two or three. Um, just out of curiosity, I thought I'd start off when Scott mentioned about the 45,000 people that might come through the doors one way or the other. Yeah, that's amazing. So, I, I'm just curious, in the last year, maybe even just the last six months, how many people in this room have stepped foot in the either hospital or urgent care <laughs> as a patient to see someone for any other service? Yeah. How many people raise your hand? My family. Yeah. yeah. So there, there's that's just my, 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 my but that's just that's yeah. just urgent and emerging care. What okay. the yeah. was behind that? Yeah, right. This this uh, PC, the multi specialty practice PC, sees fifty to sixty thousand additional visits a year. Yeah. If you add that all together, plus the five thousand admissions, that's over a hundred thousand. <clears> we yeah. barely have a hundred thousand <laughs> people in our service area. Yeah. So it must be that one guy coming through every single day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. My, my, my theory is no one really likes to go to the hospital. And well, I don't know about that. <laughs> well, no, but remember, what, what, the reason John handed out that, that grit is there's only 5,000 people annually that are admitted to the hospital. 
right? And so we're doing a good job keeping people out of the hospital. But 25,000 ER visits, 10,000 urgent care visits, and 5,000 doctor visits a month in, in all these doctor offices that we're managing. That, that just, a, for a small place, is just a staggering number, which tells us our region is just more than Auburn. You know, we look at the zip codes, you know, they're coming from Waterloo, they're coming from Seneca Falls, you know, Moravia, they're, com they're coming from uh, uh, and our neuroscience program. Maybe invite us back and we'll talk about some of our specialty programs. Jason just touched upon being a stroke center. So our ER is linked up to the University of Rochester where when we take your x-ray, your CAT scan, because you're having a stroke, it's being read and deciphered by the University of Rochester that tells our ER doctors what to do immediately. I mean, so, so just to put that example together, you, you, you would have to be within 5 to 15 minutes of the University of Rochester's emergency room, have a stroke, walk into Strong, we would end up diagnosing you faster in our ER than you would get diagnosed at, at Strong. But that's the, inter I'll bring our IT guy. Uh, the interconnectivity uh, today between electronic medical records and all the radiology that can be done here and read someplace else. Um, we can talk about telemedicine, um, but honestly, maybe in a few months um, we'll come back and begin to really talk about how do you bring expertise from Rochester and St. Joe's right to Auburn. It's happening today, whether it's the doctors who come or, or, or whether it's the doctors in those outlying areas that are reading our lab and our x-ray and interacting. So that could be a whole other discussion how technology is really helping us advance healthcare. Yeah, sure, cool. I saw your hand first. Yeah, not a question, just a comment, Dan. Uh, I think your stats are up because of me this year. <laughs> <laughs> you're that one guy. Yeah, you're that one guy. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, I know everyone in this room, I believe. I, I had eight surgeries in the last year, and several of them were Auburn, several in Syracuse. There's no comparison as far as I'm concerned. I'll never go back to Syracuse. This hospital has done such a wonderful job for not only me, but everybody locally. Uh, last summer, I almost lost my life. I had a serious blood infection. I went to Auburn Memorial. Within 15, 20 minutes, they diagnosed what it was. They said I wouldn't make it to Syracuse. Intensive care for a week. I, I, I'm alive today because of your hospital. I want to congratulate Tony and the board and Scott and the uh, staff and everyone in here, and I hope the media gets this, because we couldn't survive this community without that hospital. I'm so proud of what you have done to that hospital and what you've done for our community, and you should be congratulated. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Does anybody want to try to top that? <laughs> <laughs> that was quite, quite, quite a testimony. I, I love that. Right here. I'll dovetail off that. Readmission rates for your hospital, where they were, where they are today, where they plan on being, we've skirted upon it by saying how many people have visited your hospital. I'm curious how your hospital ranks against others, and if it's part of what you're doing today that's going to be lowering it. Yeah, we're currently Medicare penalizes hospitals <coughs> for readmissions, um, so we have a small penalty for that now, Just which is that unusual in, in the country. But what we're doing is, you know, we brought in pharmacy to, uh, to work on bedside pharmacy. Uh, we continue to look at it. We're, we're working on really integrating into the community. And the PPS is part of that, the, the Medicaid PPS. The goal is kind of for the hospitals to really start finding out why are people coming back? Are they not taking their medication? Are they not getting to their doctor's appointments? We, you know, so now they're saying hospitals, you have to be responsible. Okay, so they're penalizing us, and there's not a great incentive on the other end, but it's forcing the whole system to take over kind of the healthcare. And that's going to be more social workers involved. Right. So what he's talking about, and when, remember when I said the, the whole dynamic is changing? Five years ago, um, you could continue to be in 
admitted to the hospital and we would continue to take care of you and continue to bill for service. Well, the game, it, it's changed now. So, so what we've discovered, and again, um, relying on outside expertise, because we're small, and if we have a small issue, St. Joe's is bigger, boy, do they, have, they would have a bigger issue, and the same thing with the University of Rochester. So what I've learned, and Jason got right into the, the meat of it, it's like frequent flyers. Um, when we begin to analyze um, that population, what we're finding out is it's a certain segment of the population, um, it's a certain, certain chronic disease, and it's typically the same, I want to say the same handful of people. That's an exaggeration. But I can simply right now almost identify the hundred people in our community that seemingly get readmitted more than anybody else. Now what we're going to be responsible for is almost micromanaging those hundred people with a nurse navigator calling every day. You're a diabetic. Did you take your insulin? You know, you, you're COPD. Did you stop? So it's almost going to behoove us to micromanage that population to keep our readmission rates down. But in the meanwhile, at the macro level, we've hired more social workers, more discharge planners. Um, it's, it's, it's a very labor-intensive uh, activity. Right. And when you talk low cost, high quality, if you look at the Medicare data, the admissions per thousand Medicare beneficiaries in Cuyahoga County, we're the second lowest in, in all of New York State. For and, with an age, and with an so, aging population right. and, and the chronic disease, it, it, it becomes yeah. even more difficult. And the cost per, per beneficiary, we're the same there too. So, so we have a very low cost to take in the good outcomes for the area. Thanks for the question, you know, I had a question for you. I, I was actually there a couple times in the ER with, with a family member, and, and I will say that the, the care that this member received was excellent. And I felt that even uh, there, there was one incident, in fact, that was really an error of one of the larger hospitals, which I was really surprised about. They had an excellent reputation. That the Auburn Hospital really worked hard in trying to correct for them and clean up. So I was kind of impressed with that. My only disappointment was that I was hoping that, that this family member would be able to stay there, but they ended up having to send her to, the, to a larger hospital in Syracuse, and it was more for an orthopedic issue. Do you plan on see, you know, I mean, is there going to be um, where they'll be able to, to, to take care of the patient more there, or is it going to be more common? Because lately my experience is when I had to bring these family members, it's, it seems like we would be there, Auburn Hospital would take excellent care of them, but then they'd be transported to Syracuse. Um, yeah, John, John can address that. I, I, I think a lot of that has to do with the type and the quality of the physicians that we're able to recruit. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, we, in the past, have transferred a lot of very sick, critically ill patients out to tertiary care hospitals, and appropriately so. Recently, we have uh, recruited and retained a cardiologist who's also board certified in critical care. We have an internal medicine doctor who's a hospitalist who's also board certified in critical care. And we are pursuing, and we've been sort of promised by the University of Rochester that they will send us another board certified critical care physician from their stable out there uh, to help us out part time. That would be three critical care physicians that will be running our ICU. This is something we've never had before at Auburn Hospital. Through their expertise, we are able to keep more desperately ill, sicker patients, treat them appropriately, and turn them around, and then refer them only if there's a service that they need that we don't provide. For example, open heart surgery. We don't do open heart surgery, nor will we ever do open heart surgery. It's not appropriate at a 99-bed rural hospital. Neurosurgery, brain surgery, chest surgery. We don't do these things, and we probably never will. There are some things like vascular surgery. We are actively recruiting a vascular surgeon. So in the future, when we come back here, maybe I can show a picture of a, a BLL training.
trained vascular surgeon and you can stay here and have your procedure done here. But we recognize that. That's an excellent question. We recognize that. We are keeping more and more patients that in the past we couldn't and we hope to increase our capacity to, to keep even more. If we're able to facilitate this partnership, you know, the, the goal is the right patient at the right place at the right time. Um, I, I try not to second guess um, the, the medical staff decision. So with that patient, for example, you know, our orthopods probably could have cared for the individual. But what we don't have, for example, is infectious disease. We don't have it. So, so that, that's why uh, I sort of touched upon this partnership and relationship because it's really the ability to, to have a patient contact, do what we're supposed to do here. If you need high-end uh, cardiology, like John just talked about, we don't do cardiac catheterizations, but all of the information could go to St. Joe's. And then, you know, if it's neuroscience, you know, Joe's, St. Joe's doesn't do brain surgery, so, so then we stabilize the patient and over to Rochester you go. Um, but it's the, it's the ability of the interconnectivity um, of these organizations so, so the patient, all the information flows with the patient. And the goal, you know, of all of this is to get the right patient to the right place at the right time where they can, where they can receive the level of care. Um, and we haven't even gone to the other end of the spectrum, which is, um, you know, palliative care, uh, long-term care, assisted living. Um, you know, all of my data says the fastest growing segment of our population is the, uh, now the 85 plus, right? Um, just, just imagine, it's just this huge uh, population bubble, you know, coming right on through. Um, and that's what we're trying to care for. So as this transition happens over the next however many years to manage care away from the fee-for-service stuff, how are those decisions being made? Is there is there input from the service providers? Is it more being driven by the insurance companies? Is it regulation that's coming? Or is it a combination of all those things? How will that system be established? Who will be kind of the deciders that say, you know, the hundred of us in this room means it's going to be X number of dollars going to the system to, to provide that care and how that's distributed? Or is that still to be determined? Uh, Medicare's basically uh, want, is forcing us down. Um, the payers are the providers. Yeah. Well, I mean, they got to find a way to pay to insure everybody, right? So the only way is you better take better care of yourself or find a way to take better care of them. So they're forcing everyone to work better together um, to reduce costs and putting a burden, I think, mainly on the hospital. To, to take better care of people, including social work. Why aren't you, why aren't you getting to your appointments? Um, the PPS, the PPS in Syracuse, a lot of the uh, costs are mental health uh, driven. So how do we find a way to take care of them, keep them out of the emergency room, and, uh, and and living better lives? But you know, there's a whole. Everyone's trying. People are talking more and more than I think they've ever had in healthcare. And I've done work in some of the rural hospitals, and, and they understand that the best care is the local care, the high cost, the low cost provider, um, and how do you form those relationships. So it's, it's constant, it's moving very quickly, and uh, you know, it comes down to the numbers, and the, but Medicare is really, the, uh, the only way they can pay for this is to reduce costs. The other thing that's going to happen is there's going to be some, some gatekeepers. Classically, in a capitated system, the gatekeepers have been the primary care doctors. As we move forward, we will see who those gatekeepers actually will be. You know, since we actually have a, 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 a decrease in primary care in this town over the last 10 or 20 years, our specialists are actually seeing and functioning uh, in the primary care realm. So the, it depends on what the definition of primary care is. but. Uh, you know, a primary care doctor can see a patient two or three times a year. Well, a patient who's a brittle diabetic or somebody who has congestive heart failure and keeps going into congestive heart failure every 30 to 60 days, 
this, these are very, very difficult patients, but one admission to the hospital may cost $10,000. How many visits to the primary care doctor will $10,000 pay for? Maybe that patient should be going back every month to see their primary care doctor. Now you multiply that by the number of patients who need that care versus the number of primary care doctors we have, and you can now see why we are moving into the primary care realm. There's going to be a much greater need for primary care services where the patient, the patient's family, their home health care workers, and the primary care doc all have to work together to try to keep that patient well enough and keep them out of the hospital. The hospital will hopefully always be there when we're needed, but like I said, the finances are one hospital admission could be conservatively $10,000. How many visits to the physician, or how many home health nurses could that $10,000 pay for? Quite a few. So it's important to get a seat at the table, all right? And so one of the reasons we put in your packet um, um, all these agencies that we were able to sort of get all under the hospital umbrella. So, so Jason and I, um, um, and sometimes Tony, and sometimes John, we meet with the New York Department of Health on a regular basis. So the answer to your question, it's the payers. So Medicare uh, are the 65 plus population and that's the federal government. Medicaid um, are, is the state government. Uh, and then Blue Cross Blue Shield and the commercial payers. So, so to, in addition to sort of running the hospital, running the nursing home, doing the strategic planning, where we are, we, I, we're at the table with the Department of Health and the Department of Welfare to talk about Medicaid reform. We insisted that Auburn has a seat at that table, and we have that seat at that table with um, John McCabe from SUNY Upstate, Kathy Rizzito from St. Joe's, us and Scott Parra from um, Fax and St. Luke's. Um, why other hospital executives didn't, didn't push to be at that table, we don't understand, because with $7.6 billion um, coming into New York for reform, we, we insisted, and, and, and Tony and the board pushed us to, to make sure that we were front and center and that we had a seat at that table. Uh, yesterday, we spent the afternoon with Excellus uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield talking about different products which will be rolled out to the consumers and, and how we could work together uh, to achieve those goals. Um, I just wanted to touch on one other thing that uh, uh, Tony suggested. Um, we're, we're doing more and more with the University of Rochester. They're helping us recruit um, neurology. And John can talk about neurology. We're recruiting pain physicians from the University of Rochester. We're talking to them about radiology uh, as we speak. Um, so when I talk about levels of integration, it's one thing to technologically um, be connected there. But physically, um, we either have faculty from the University of Rochester driving out in their cars to develop neuroscience programs. That's been going on for close to five years, okay? Um, and, and now we're talking about integrating some of our other service lines um, with either St. Joe's or the university. So it kind of gets back to your question earlier. Pretty soon, the same physician that you would see, whether you went to Joe's or whether you went to Rochester, we're trying to get to the point where the doctors are coming here to see the patients here because as we're discovering, we're, we are the high quality, low cost provider and in the next delivery system, that, that's how it's supposed to work. And when, when you look at cost, 10% of our employees make up 65% of the cost. So that'd be similar to the school district, the county, the city, they're self-employed, self self-insured for health insurance. So if we can reduce, get those 10%, help manage their care better, provide support, that's where we can reduce some costs. And we're looking at, at that internally and getting the data by partnering with Blue Cross, getting at that data to us so we can take a look at it and then really work with, with the employee, the family, what, 
forth can be done. And to also by getting some of that claims data, um, you know, who might be at risk to, to move into that 10% uh, and try to try to help them. Time for one quick last question. I saw Rob's hand a little bit ago. Rob, take it away, quick. Um, this is a, a question for the, you know, really the whole board, but um, we've talked a little bit about partnerships today and, and partnering with some other hospitals outside of our region. Um, I'm just kind of curious, what do you see as the benefits of that? You know, I mean, we're talking about shared technology and having doctors being able to see, so I've heard that loud and clear, but are, are there other things that you see that would come out of Intellectual and capital. I mean, you know, you're, I mean, there's only so many things that we can think of, and when you start to deal with others outside, um, uh, they, they have expertise that we don't have. So I get tremendous benefit as we come down this road of, of managed care. Um, a commitment to keeping us an acute care hospital. Um, that's getting tougher and tougher in today's age, but if you can get partners who also believe in keeping a full service acute care hospital in Auburn, because it's in their best interest as well, they have the resources also to help us do that. Access to capital. Uh, I've been at Auburn eight, nine years. Very, very difficult to make a one or two percent margin. So a hundred million, a million. It costs us two million dollars a year just to reinvest in technology, okay? So access to capital. Um, uh, those are the, and I think Tony touched upon those. The other, the other thing would be uh, when we move to population health. You know, the numbers we threw out, <coughs> we say that our, our numbers are 100,000 covered lives. That's a big number, but it's not nearly big enough to, to go to insurance companies and, and really beat them up and get the best deal you can. If you join a network or a network of networks, then you have millions of covered lives, and now you're really able to do something. And the University of Rochester has that expertise and has done that already in the Rochester region. St. Joe's is gaining that expertise. They are already putting together insurance uh, joint venture products. Um, and if you can get on board with those two larger systems, I think that's gonna save us a lot of time and a lot of money. And you can manage your risk a lot better. I mean, if we have a very small pool and 10 people get very, very sick, you know, you, 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 we're gonna go at risk for managing a a pool of a population, which is completely different than the way it has always been. You get sick, you come to the hospital, we fix you, we send you better. But, but now the whole reimbursement system, whether it's Medicare, Medicaid, or commercial carriers. So if we represent 100,000 covered lives, because that's how we begin to talk, um, if you can join larger organizations and they're bringing a million covered lives into that, then it's just the ripple effect. The larger the pool, the, the less ripple when one thing falls out. You can absorb more risk. Scott, that's going to be it. <laughs> <laughs> I said I was going to keep it tight. Um, I, I, I looked for the pause, but um, <laughs> Scott, Scott, Scott loves his stuff, and I wanted to uh, wrap up with a few housekeeping things, but not uh, without first uh, asking for a round of applause. For Best idea was yet to come, but you're going to have to, no, you have to wait. I'm going to wait until right. next time. Um, just a couple things to wrap up with. Um, uh, as I called on Rob, I'm realizing that I, th I think we have the, um, the value of having the citizen uh, participate in our program again this year. It appears that some of this information might be uh, tomorrow's news story, maybe? Yes. And um, so that's. And it'll be on the website. And it'll be on the website, so it's a nice way to carry forward this message, as we all do in our own ways individually, but uh, that's certainly a, a, a great value that the citizen offers for us. Um, I just wanted to point out just a couple of things. Uh, the committee that works behind the scenes to make all this happen um, does so, and uh, we enjoy doing that. Meg O'Connell was a member of the committee that helped me make sure that this panel came together today. I wanted to call on her specifically. And then Jesse Klein is the one that really makes everything happen. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Jesse would have uh, have me uh, um, in big trouble if I didn't. And please say to you that we've got some surveys. Those surveys actually do um, add value to the committee's work. So I think they're on the back tables. It takes all of about 30 seconds to put down a thought or circle a, a number. Um, so if you think of it on the way out, grab a survey. Um, I did see that um, up on the front table there's some more of these packets that the hospital brought. So if you wanted some of that information, make sure you grab that. Um, name tags, don't walk out to the parking lot with your name tag, drop those. That's another thing Jesse uh, really gets aggravated by. And last but not least, uh, next month, October, um, comes into the political season and we always try to spice it up with a little bit of politics. I think next month we've got uh, two uh, newcomers to politics and two people that are running for mayor in the city of Auburn. Um, so joining us for a, uh, a little bit of a debate dialogue. And the last I heard, Guy Cosentino was working on getting Donald Trump to join them. <laughs> so it should be fun. Have a good morning. Thank you.